Well, a number of years ago, my brother Joe and I got the crazy idea to test ourselves by signing up for a triathlon, you know, one of those races where you swim, bike, and run in the same race. Now, it wasn't an Ironman, which is a really, really long race. It was a mini triathlon. It only took about two hours to complete, not like the eight or ten hours that an Ironman takes. So we took about six months to train, and then we were all ready to go. The race was up in Crystal Lake, Illinois, uh, in I think the first week of June or so. So we showed up that morning with our bikes and our gear, and the first thing we noticed was all these people unloading their stuff in the parking lot and pulling on full wetsuits for the swim. And we were like, get a load of these guys. I mean, wetsuits? Come on, man. But then the race started, and the, the water in Crystal Lake in the first week of June was at like 66 degrees. Doesn't sound cold, but it was so cold that within about 10 seconds, I completely hyperventilated. I couldn't catch my breath. I was sucking in water, uh, couldn't breathe. And the group that started behind us caught up and started swimming right over top of me. I mean, kicking me in the head, pushing me down in the water. I had no idea it was going to be that violent. So now I'm just trying to survive. Um, and after a couple of minutes of this, uh, I was reduced to just dog paddling in the water trying to catch my breath. And before I know it, a guy comes up next to me in a rowboat and he yells over to me, hey, buddy, had enough? And I realized he was trying to rescue me. Now, uh, I knew my brother was way ahead of me. He was a strong swimmer. And I thought if I quit this race like five minutes in, I will never hear the end of it from my brother. So I said to the guy, no, I'm good. I'm good. Like, this is just how I swim. And I just kept paddling. Well, when I eventually made it to shore, my brother had been waiting for me there for like 15 minutes, and he had started to worry that maybe something really bad had happened. But when he saw me start to stagger out of the water, he was completely doubled over in laughter, just like a brother should be. And then we did the biking part together, we did the run together, and we crossed the finish line exactly together like we wanted to. And the funny part was, when we finally got the printout of the race results, they listed me as finishing one spot ahead of my brother. So to this day, I tease him about the day I beat him in that triathlon. Now we're in a series of messages right now from the book of Philippians in the New Testament called Choosing Joy. You remember that the Apostle Paul is in prison. He's chained to an elite Roman guard 24-7, and he's writing a letter to his dear friends at the church in Philippi. And his focus has been, each chapter so far, on how Jesus is the source of his joy. Now today we pick it up in the third chapter of Philippians. I'm going to read just a few verses beginning in verse 12. Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained this. Let me pause there uh, right away. The word Paul uses for obtained means to take hold of something, to seize, to grab onto something. So picture a group of bridesmaids uh, trying to catch the bouquet or, or maybe a football player trying to, to tackle the quarterback. He says, not that I have already obtained, taken hold of this. Now, what's the this he's talking about? Well, here's what Paul has just been talking about in previous verses, what we saw last week. He had said, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. Paul's talking about how Jesus is the source of his identity and the source of his joy. Remember Jeff's illustration of the juice box last week? If you haven't heard that message, go back and listen to it. Paul says, not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect. Now the word perfect means complete or mature. But I press on to make it my own. Same word, to take hold of, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Again, same word. Christ Jesus has taken hold of me, made me his own. Now let me stop here just for a moment. If we miss this next little point, uh, we'll miss the central message of the entire letter to the Philippians. We'll miss the central point of this entire series. Indeed, we miss the whole center of the gospel itself. But because Paul's motivation here is not trying to be a better person. Paul's not trying to stack up a bunch of good deeds to try to prove to God that he deserves his favor. Paul rather is saying, Jesus has taken hold of me. Jesus seized me. He chased me down and he captured me. And he uses the same word to describe both his pursuit of Christ and Christ's pursuit 
of him. Now, what Paul's talking about here is his own conversion story. He's talking about his own transformation from Saul of Tarsus to Paul, apostle of Christ. He's talking about how Jesus chased him down, confronted him in overwhelming grace, and took hold of him. Now, let me ask you, as we begin, when and how did Jesus take hold of you? Can you remember? Can you describe that? For me, it began when I was eight years old. I heard a guest speaker at our church one Sunday night say this phrase. He said, you're not a Christian here tonight just because your parents are. And Jesus used that phrase to take hold of my young life. Many years later, when I was about 22 and wrestling with the direction of my life, uh, I sensed him say to me, I want you. I want you to spend your life in ministry. And he took hold of me again. For you, it might have been a, a Billy Graham crusade. It might have been listening to a sermon in your home church. It might have been through some difficult life experience. But you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus took hold of you. Now, if you aren't sure, or you're not really sure what I'm talking about, never have had that experience, I really hope and we hope that this series that will week by week uh, help you know and understand that Jesus wants to take hold of you and your life. Verse 13, he continues. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. I want to talk uh, today about three powerful verbs Paul uses here in this passage. First, he says, pressing on. The first key to joy in Christ is pressing on. Now, it's one word in Greek, dioko. Let me try to explain what it means. Uh, way, way back in 1984 or so, I was finishing seminary and working as a part-time youth pastor in Glen Ellen, Illinois. Uh, and it was Michael Jordan's uh, very first season with the Bulls. And so you could, at that time, still drive down to the old Chicago Stadium and buy a ticket for like eight bucks. And even then, the stadium was only half full. So one night I took a couple of my young high school guys from group uh, down to watch Jordan play against the Boston Celtics. And the star player for the Celtics at, the, at that time, as you may know, was Larry Bird, and he was the reigning MVP of the league. We got to the stadium early, about two hours before tip-off, I think, and there were only two players on the court at that time, Larry Bird and one of his teammates. And they were going back and forth, playing kind of a full-court game of one-on-one, -on -one, just the two guys, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, working on their skills, ball handling, playing defense, taking shots. Bird was taking shots from every different kind of angle, from every different kind of distance, and he did this for like 20 minutes until both of their shirts were soaked with sweat. And this is like an hour and a half before game time. It dawned on me that this is the best player in the world at that time, and he was practicing, still practicing practicing to improve his skills. That's what Paul means by pressing on. Verse 12, he says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect or mature, but I press on. Now, to press on means to pursue, to aggressively chase after something. And interestingly, this is the very same word Paul used to describe his own former zeal for persecuting the church and any follower of Jesus he could get his hands on. Pastor Tim Keller describes pressing on as a spiritual ferocity, he says. He says the Christian life is caused by and results in spiritual ferocity. Paul says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. This is the Apostle Paul writing. He's planted churches all over the Roman world. He's been beaten and shipwrecked and imprisoned, all because of his faith in Christ and his, his uh, relentless passion to preach the gospel. He wrote 13 of the 27 books we have in the New Testament, and he's not there yet. He hasn't fully taken hold of it yet. He still has things to learn about Jesus as a source of his identity and joy. He's telling us three things here. First, he's saying, join the club. 
He's saying that spiritual growth is a lifelong process, and it's for everyone, including him. He's also saying, I think, that spiritual maturity is not a passive process. It's active and dynamic and sometimes hard. Just as a basketball player presses on even when he's already the best player in the league, so Paul the Apostle pressed on in his relationship with Christ. I was thinking about that this week and realized that some of the, the people who inspire me most in the time I've been here at Chapel Street are people who I know are in their 70s or 80s, even their 90s, and they're still pressing on in their faith, still pressing on toward maturity. Now, why would Paul say this specifically to the Philippians? Why is this in the letter? Well, last week, Pastor Jeff mentioned a group called the Judaizers who were confusing the young Philippian believers by teaching that they also had to observe and practice certain Jewish identity markers in order to be good followers of Jesus. Food laws, circumcision, religious laws. And to these people, Paul would say, you can observe all the religious rules you want, but they won't make you new, and they won't make you more and more like Jesus. Even more so, I think Paul is speaking to what I would call the spiritually discouraged. Those who are struggling with the shame and guilt of their pagan past lives. Those who feel like they could never then measure up to Christ. He's saying, yes, 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 the journey of spiritual growth is long and sometimes hard. But don't give up. Press on. We're going to talk more about that in just a minute. I think he's also speaking, perhaps, to the spiritually proud. To those who think that because of their education or their affluence or their family background or their squeaky clean moral lives that they are now somehow more deserving of God's favor and blessing than others. I wonder if you've ever known someone like that. I've known a few. Not much fun to be around. He's saying to them, just because you're a super good person, just because you were baptized, just because you have a fish bumper sticker on your car, just because you wear a Chapel Street face mask, don't assume you've arrived at spiritual maturity. Don't assume you're growing more and more like Jesus. I think he might also be speaking to what I would call the spiritually complacent or the spiritually lazy. Those who maybe struggle to to make time to uh, read the Bible or to make time to pray with any regularity or or to worship with their church family in person or online. Because there's just so many other things to do, they just don't get around to it. Or, Or to those who occasionally go to worship services but who are quite content to watch others serve and give. He would say, for you it's time to get in the game. Spiritual growth. Spiritual maturity is not a spectator sport, he would say. Secondly, Paul is saying that spiritual growth requires intense effort. Sometimes I think we tend to assume that when we come to faith in Jesus, we trust him for the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternal life, that that's pretty much it. That all we need to do then is sort of occasionally show up at church and he does the rest. But if that were true, why do we so often still struggle with things like patience or kindness or forgiveness or anger. If that were so, then why do we still struggle to experience the joy that Paul's talking about? Why do we still struggle with certain destructive habits or sinful patterns in our lives? Paul is saying that spiritual growth does not happen naturally. Rather, it's profoundly unnatural for us. Spiritual growth requires intentional and sustained effort, even for Paul. Paul is saying that the key to spiritual growth is pressing on. Secondly, the key, uh, second key is what Paul calls simply forgetting. Forgetting. Now, when I was uh, about 11 years old playing Little League Baseball, I remember... Um, that one game came and I I struck out with the bases loaded to end the game, the last out of the game. And I think I cried all the way home in the car, just crestfallen, devastated. My team had a chance to win and I I struck out. I failed. I let them down. And later that night I was inconsolable, just hiding up in my room. And my dad eventually came in 
and sat down on the end of my bed. I think he just sat there for a good while. And then when he finally spoke, he said, do you know how many home runs Babe Ruth hit? And I was a little bit confused because why would he ask that when I, when I just struck out with the bases loaded? But he knew I knew the answer. And I said, 714. And then he said, do you know how many times he struck out? Now that I did not know. So I just shook my head. And my dad said, he struck out over a thousand times. The real number is 1,330. Almost twice as many times as he hit home runs. And then he just said, everyone strikes out, even Babe Ruth. Just forget about it and go get him next time. I didn't feel all that much better about striking out, but it did give me a different perspective. And interestingly, later that very same season, probably just a couple of weeks later, one of my few clear memories of Little League, I came up to bat again in a different game with the bases loaded. This time against the kid who was the best pitcher in the league and everybody was scared of him. I managed to stick my bat out, hit a triple, and ended up being the hero of the game. But what if the failure is a little more serious than striking out with the bases loaded? What if it's divorce or addiction or infidelity? What if the pain is more profound? What if it's physical or emotional abuse or some devastating loss? What then? Paul says, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Let's think for just a moment what Paul might mean when he says forgetting what is behind. I think he's talking about failure, sin, and pain. And I often think about the failure, sin, and pain of the past like a backpack, like a, a heavy, cumbersome backpack. And in some ways, I think we all, we all carry one of these around with us in one way or another. Now, Paul was once Saul of Tarsus. His mission in life, as we know, was to rid the world of this new cult of Jesus' followers. And in Acts chapter 7, we read the story of a man named Stephen, a follower of Jesus who the Bible says was full of God's grace and power. Now, Stephen was accused of blasphemy, dragged before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, who then condemned him to death by stoning. And the Bible tells us that this mob then uh, laid their cloaks before they stoned Stephen to death. They laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now the scene is captured in this painting by a Renaissance artist named Karachi, painted in 1603. If you take a look at this painting, you'll notice that Stephen is on the left side, lower, lower in, the, in the picture, uh, kneeling, waiting for the stones to fall. On the far right of the image, if you look carefully, that's Saul, and he's sitting next to a pile of coats, and he's watching. Later in Acts 22, Paul recounts the story like this. He says, And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Paul was there. Not only was Paul there, he approved, he watched, and he was happy to see Stephen die. But I don't think Paul ever forgot Stephen's words. Acts chapter 7 tells us that while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Sound familiar? And when he said this, he fell asleep or he died. So I think the two great defining moments of Paul's life were first the stoning death of Stephen as he forgave those who threw the rocks, and secondly, Jesus confronting him on the road to Damascus. So when Paul says, forgetting what is behind, what's behind includes a horrific stoning death, the martyrdom of a man named Stephen. And by forgetting, he doesn't mean sort of selective amnesia. He means that God, in his grace, does not hold his past against him, therefore neither should he. Do you know, this is one of our enemy's favorite tools. In fact, one of Satan's names in the Bible is the accuser of the brethren. Satan loves to use our failures and our sin against us. He whispers to us, would you just look at yourself? Look at yourself. You call yourself a Christian? You really think Jesus can forgive that and maybe even that? Or how about all the pain in your life? Do you think God really loves you, allowing you to go through all that mess? Know this. When you hear that little voice that makes you feel failure, 
and shame. That voice is not God's voice. The Holy Spirit will confront, will convict us, but always, always to forgive, to cleanse, restore, but never to shame. So let me ask you, what's in your backpack today? What kind of shame or pain do you carry around with you day after day, year after year? What do you remember from the past that keeps you from joy in Christ today? Paul says, forget it. Forget what is behind. He's basically saying, just leave it. Give it to Jesus. God doesn't hold your past against you, and neither should you. Paul's also talking about forgetting his former identity. Pastor Jeff covered this last week. Paul had built his personal identity on a whole bunch of things. His national identity, his family pedigree, his religious accomplishments, his education, his zeal for the law. But he discovered that all of that, all of it was garbage, refuse, even worse, when compared to the greatness of knowing Christ, of being in Christ. Paul's saying, I no longer depend on those cultural and religious markers, those personal achievements for my identity. I'm forgetting all that. I'm leaving it behind because my identity now is established in Christ. So the second key to spiritual growth and joy is forgetting. And thirdly, Paul says the third key is straining forward. Straining forward. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, that stretching or reaching intently to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. I think after reading um, all of Paul's letters in the New Testament, um, I'm pretty sure Paul was a sports fan. I mean, maybe not a sports fan the way we think of sports fans, but I think he watched and enjoyed athletic contests and the games of his time. If you read through his letters, at different times he, he compares spiritual life to a wrestling match. He compares it to a boxing match, to a fight, to running a race. And I think here Paul is imagining a great and grueling race. He says, I press on toward the goal. Now the goal, the finish line, we already know for Paul, is knowing Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, just we saw it last week, he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participating in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. That's his goal. That's the finish line. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. Now the prize, that's the reward. Uh, that goes to the winner of the race, to the victor. That's the trophy. And he says it's the upward call of Christ Jesus. Now this is the hope of eternal life. This is Paul thinking about the promise of worshiping and serving and rejoicing in the new heaven and new earth, reigning with Jesus in heaven itself. This is why in Philippians chapter 1 he said, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And the result of pressing on, the result of forgetting what's behind, the result of straining forward is maturity. Verse 15, let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Uh, Pastor Joe Scavato and I were talking as we, we were both preparing this uh, message uh, this week, and Joe said something in our conversation I thought was really good. He said, you know, no one drifts into maturity. No one drifts into spiritual maturity, and that's true. I think Paul would agree. Maturity is forged through pressing on, forgetting, and straining for what's ahead. To experience maturity, you have to run. You have to get in the race and run. And if you can't run, you walk. And if you can't walk, you crawl. Just press on, Paul would say. Now, some of you may remember the story of a man named John Stephen Akwari. He was a Tanzanian marathon runner who competed in the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico City. Uh, he was a world-class runner, but uh, in Mexico City, uh, he experienced cramping 
in the first uh, 15 miles or so because he had not been able to train at altitude in his home country, Tanzania. But then at about the 19-mile mark, he was bumped by another group of runners, uh, stepped in a hole, fell awkwardly, and partially dislocated his knee and injured one of his shoulders. But he managed to, to get up, barely able to, to stand and stagger forward, and he shuffled forward for the last seven miles of that race. And when he finally entered the stadium, limping badly, he was over an hour behind the rest of the runners, and the stadium was almost empty. And when he finally limped across the finish line, there were a few reporters left who noticed, and they gathered around him, and they had one question for him. They said, Mr. Ekwari, why did you bother to continue after you'd fallen and injured yourself so badly? Why did you bother to come into the stadium when you were over an hour behind? And John Akwari said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to begin the race. My country sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. I think the Apostle Paul would have loved that story. Because he knew that the race of discipleship, the race of spiritual growth, the race of maturity and joy is long and sometimes hard. And he would want us to know that growing weary does not disqualify us. Press on, he would say. That falling doesn't disqualify you from the race. Keep pressing on. That failure doesn't disqualify you. Keep pressing on. Why? Because Jesus has taken hold of you. And that's why in Philippians 1, a couple of weeks ago, we saw this verse, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. So press on. Press on. Bow with me for prayer. Lord, how we thank you for your word. We thank you for the great truth, the encouraging truth, that by your grace, our past failures do not disqualify us from your joy. Thank you for the challenge to press on, to chase after, to take hold of you. Because you have already taken hold of us. And by your spirit working in us, grant us the courage, the strength, and the grace to finish the race. Amen.